Lord, we're trusting that when our worlds don't make sense, that you're still at work bringing something good out of something really bad. And sometimes it's hard for us to see it or believe it. And so we get really discouraged, we get sad, we, we become troubled, and sometimes we turn inward and we just get stuck. I pray that you would give us eyes to see what we've not been able to. I pray that you would help all of us to become more aware of the fact that you are with us and for us and that you are in the process of making all things new, including our lives. And so with what time remains, with open ears, and hearts and minds, I ask that you would move among us and speak to us in the places of our lives that we most need to be spoken to. In Christ we pray. Amen. So I want you to see something, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. Emily? So... This is an optical illusion. In fact, it's one of the more famous optical illusions that exist. How many of you guys have ever seen this picture before? So you're, some of you are familiar. So for those of you who've never seen this, I want you to think about what it is that you're looking at right now because there's the possibility that you will see one of two things. Okay? So... This is called wife and mother-in-law, or the boring figurine. It has two names. So if you're between 18 and 30, because there was a university, Flinders University in Australia, that did a study on this optical illusion. If you're between 18 and 30 years old, the preponderance of results showed that you would first see the wife who is facing away. Her chin is here, her nose is here, her eyes is here. This is what you would see if you are younger. But if you were older than 30, you would see the mother-in-law who has sort of a scarf on her head, her chin is here, her mouth is here, her nose is here, her eye is here. And what they determine from the study and I did my own little survey. I did it with Emily when we came in. I said, Emily, have you ever seen this before? She said, no. I said, what do you see? And she said, I see the young lady who's facing away. I said, you're still young. Because I saw the old lady. Now, you can put yourself in whatever category you want, but the very first thing that you will see, what they, what they determine is that our age impacts the way that we see things, that there's a certain bias if we're younger or if we're older as to what it is that we see. It's kind of freaky, isn't it? Now, how many of you guys who are like over 40 saw the young lady first? Wow, you just totally destroyed the study. <laughs> You're just wanting to be younger than you are. You saw the old lady first. How many of you that are younger, like, 18 to 30, saw the old lady first. Saw the old lady first. I definitely saw the old lady first. I knew I was in the old category from the start. But, but it makes a larger point, which is what I want you to pay attention to. <laughs> Your eyes are opening to new things. Do you see both? So here's, here's the young lady. She has a hat, she has hair, she has a chin, she has a nose, and an eyelash. It's the young lady. The old lady is here. She has a big chin, a big nose, her mouth, and her eye. Okay? So that's all you're going to remember from this talk, pretty much. I'm pretty much am resigned to the fact that that's all you're going to remember. So maybe we need to like go back and put that up because if I leave that up behind me, I'm never going to get anything accomplished. <laughs> so here's, here's the larger point to what I want to talk about. There are many factors that determine how it is that we look at the world. 
Our age is one of them. Our race and ethnicity is one of them. Our family background and traditions. There are a variety of things that determine how we look at the world. Because the truth of the matter is, we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. And why this is important is because sometimes we can be looking at something and totally miss what someone else sees. We can actually, I do this all the time when I go to look for something in my refrigerator. I'm looking right at mustard and it's what I want, but I just don't see mustard. I do it almost on a daily basis, either in my refrigerator or pantry. And so there are things that are impacting how we look at the world. We don't all look at the world in the same way, do we? It's the cause of some of the strife that we have. Because you and I look at things differently, we oftentimes decide that we have to have a dividing line between us and them. When if we were patient with one another and had the desire to learn a little bit, we might actually do that. And so what I want to talk with you about this morning is, is this idea of spiritual blindness. Because there are many things that I think exist in our personal world that we miss on a daily basis and it impacts us in a great way. And if our eyes were opened, if we could see, it might just well change the way in which not only we look at the world, but we look at ourselves and others as well. It might change the way in which we relate to God. And so, just before I read you the, the story that I had told you about earlier that I was going to share with you, last week, if you weren't here, we were talking about how with the resurrection of Christ, with the idea, with the category in your brain that life actually conquers death, because most of us don't really have that category in our head. It's not really firmly entrenched. Typically, when something or someone dies, it so wrecks us that we just try to cope as best we can, but the idea that God is taking something and making something new from that, it's a, it's a struggle for many of us. And so until we come to grips with the fact that that category in our brain is open, that it exists, we'll never believe that that resurrection can happen in other areas of our lives. Because if life conquers death, then what else can't be conquered, right? That means that all of my faults and failures have the capacity to be redeemed, restored, renewed, resurrected. It means I don't have to stay stuck in my worst moments, in my deepest failures, in my greatest losses. I don't have to stay stuck there. And so last week we were talking about how Peter went from like just the depths of his greatest failure and how he was restored and ushered back into the game. That the risen Christ had a plan for his life beyond the things that caused him to feel like he had arrived at a dead end. And today we're going to be introduced to two people who are walking from Jerusalem, where the events of the crucifixion happened, to a town seven miles away called Emmaus. And they are really deeply sad. Why? Because they had put all of their eggs into the Jesus basket, and the Jesus basket fell and broke, and they had no hope. All of their hope was placed in him. And when they took him away and they put him in a tomb, they also put away their hopes and dreams and plans for a better future. And so as they're leaving, the resurrection has occurred, but they've not yet seen Jesus. Jesus has appeared to multiple other people. It's three days later, and they are walking with their heads hung. They are moving away from their hopes and dreams, and they're trying to figure out what to do next with their lives. And that's where we pick up the story. Find this in Luke chapter 24, beginning with verse 13. It reads as follows. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, 
seven miles from Jerusalem, and as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them, but God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as intently as you walk along? And they stopped short, sadness written across their faces. And then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened here in the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. And this all happened three days ago. It's a hilarious story, really. Right? So they're walking away from the town where the events of Jesus' crucifixion had taken place. And as they're walking away, the scripture says sadness is written across their faces. They're in a place of despair, in a place of hopelessness. And as they're walking along, going from Jerusalem to this town Emmaus, along comes a stranger who walks up beside them. The scriptures tell us this is Jesus. And as Jesus walks along beside them, they are prevented from seeing who it is that he is. And so he comes alongside and says, hey, what's going on? And they said, have you been living under a rock? You must be the only person in all of the area who has no idea what's going on. Why would you ask such a question? And so they began to give him the details about what had happened to him. They began to tell his story to him. And as he walks along, they are prevented from seeing him. And as I was looking at the text this week, I thought to myself, how often as I am moving in my places of despair and hopelessness that I have been unable to see and experience the real presence of God in my life. It would be as if he didn't exist. And I wondered about what it was. Remember the lens through which we look at the world shapes what we see. And I wondered if what it was that they were looking at caused them to be unable to see him. Now, in this particular story, we know that sadness was coloring their worldview. We know that unmet expectation, right? They had, we had hoped. They had an expectation of who he was and what he was going to do in their lives. Unanswered prayer. These are the kinds of things that, in addition to our age and ethnicity and our family experiences, these are the kinds of things that shape the way that we see. And I wondered, as I was thinking about my own life and sharing this story with you, if, if that may well be what has been keeping you from seeing Jesus as he walks right beside you in the places of your deepest despair. Sadness can be very powerful. Anger can be very powerful. Fear can be very powerful. There are things that we carry with us and sometimes if we carry them long enough with us they will cause our picture of life to become distorted. And it will make us believe as if there is no God for us. When all along the way, he's walking with us. And he's engaging us in ways that we cannot yet see. Because our lens, because the category in our mind doesn't believe that resurrection is possible. They don't believe it. Others had told stories that it was happening, but they had not yet experienced it. And because they hadn't experienced, they couldn't see it. And because they couldn't see it, Jesus just walks along with them, asking them questions. I think it's a hilarious story. But it doesn't feel so hilarious when it's happening to you and me. And so... 
Before we move to the second part of the story and the final piece of the story, I just want you to think about how you came in today. You know, two weeks ago we celebrated Easter. We celebrated the resurrection of Christ. And I always, I've been here 24 years now, so I've done it 24 times with you or a different version of you. And I'm always taken aback at how excited we are on Easter Sunday, but like the, the following Sunday, the level of energy is very noticeably different than on that one day. And it makes me think to myself, like, are we celebrating a day or are we celebrating a new reality where God is among us making all things new on Easter and the day after and the day after and the day after and the day after? Like, what are we celebrating? Because with the process, with the event of the resurrection, it sets off a process where God is making all things new, including you. Do you see it? What do you see? So he continues along. Let me finish the story and make just another point or two. Verse 22, Then some women from our group of his followers were at the tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and they, that they had seen angels who told them that Jesus is alive. And some of the men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, You, you foolish people, you, you find it so hard to believe that all the prophets wrote in the Scriptures. But wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering His glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining for all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. By this time they were nearing Emmaus, the end of their journey, and Jesus acted as if He were going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them, and as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it, and he gave it to them, and suddenly their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. That's a bummer. <laughs> I mean, that is just a bummer. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road? and explained the scriptures to us. And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven disciples and the others who gathered with them, who said, The Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then the two from Emmaus told the story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road, and how they'd recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you. Yeah, I think he probably needed to say that. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking that they were seeing a ghost. It's a crazy story, right? It's, a, it's one of those kinds of things where you're walking along and you just, you're not looking for something. And all of a sudden, the thing that you're not looking for, but that you desperately need, is right in front of you. Jesus, as he walks along the path with these two, starts to give them kind of a Bible study. And he takes them through the Old Testament, all the prophets. He, he's basically telling them what he had been trying to tell them before his death. He had told them six times what was going to happen. But they couldn't hear it, they couldn't see it, because in their mind the Messiah looked different. The Messiah was more powerful. He came with more authority and might. He was going to help them turn the table so that those who were lording over them would be under them. But that's not who he was and that's not what he was about. So they couldn't see it because they were looking for something different. And he takes them through exactly what the Messiah was to be like. He gives them the study and then, then they get to a place where it's like, he, he's like, all right, I'll see you guys later. And they're like, no, no, it's, it's late, it's dark, it, it's, it's dangerous, come on in. And so he comes in, and much like he does when he's breaking the bread at the table with the disciples in his last supper, as soon as he breaks the loaf, their eyes are opened. And for the first time in three days, 
Hope is being renewed and restored. They are starting to feel the resurrection themselves. They're starting to experience the power of what it means that in their minds now, life is stronger than death. And so they see him for who he is. And bummer of all bummers, he just then disappears. I don't know. He's like Kreskin or something, you know. <laughs> he's there. He's not there. But they're so excited, this group, that these two that were so sad, so despondent, so hopeless, now they decide late at night they're going to go seven miles back. They're not thinking about how dangerous it is. They're not thinking about how tired they are. They're not thinking about how late it is. What they're thinking about is we have to help other people know what we now know. We have to help people who can't see this now see. Because this has blown our minds but it's true it's real we saw it and that's really what the Christian faith is about it's not about good people become or bad people becoming good it has nothing to do with that at all we try to moralize things it's really not about bad people becoming good it's about dead people becoming alive that's what the Christian faith is about and so as we look at and we listen to this story it's about God restoring and making all things new it's about, about resurrecting families. It's about resurrecting careers. It's about resurrecting reputations. It's about resurrecting our eyes. It's about, it's about seeing a new way. And I think, you know, for those who have eyes to see, God is always at work around us, even when we least expect it. Even when we're in spaces where it doesn't feel as if he's there. He's walking alongside us. And that's what I often do when I'm in that space where it feels as if God isn't real, doesn't exist, and I'm left to my own devices. Because there are days when I feel like that. And then I just ask, God, would you resurrect my eyes? Would you help me to see what I can't see? Because I'm running low on faith fuel. And I just need to see what I can't see. Because I'm just not feeling it today. And what I think is, on the other side of the resurrection, even if our eyes aren't yet tuned to the, that reality for us, if you begin looking for things that you don't think are there, the greater the possibility that you will see. Now, now, these two, they weren't even looking for it. So sometimes we stumble into it. Sometimes God is gracious and presents God's self in ways that surprise us. But what I have found is that when I am looking for something, I tend to find it. And I wonder if in certain places of our life, if we just really stop looking if we really stop seeking, searching. Because I believe if you seek after truth, you will find it, and it will set you free. And Jesus said, the truth is embodied in me and who I am. And once you realize that there is something stronger than death, then you will realize that there's no point in your life at which you've come to that I can't do something great and renew and resurrect and revive. You don't yet believe it, but I pray that you would have the eyes to see. Because once you see it, it changes everything. Then you know that God is not only making all things new, heavens and earth, but God is making you new. Will you open to it? Will you look for it? Will you receive it? That really is the question. But Ever since the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the scriptures tell us that God is in the process of making all things new. And I wonder if you can see it. And if you can't, it is my prayer, like it is many days in my lives, in my life, that God would open your eyes and help you to see what you've become spiritually blind to. 
because it's a game changer once you can see. And that's my prayer for us. Two weeks on the other side of Easter. That we would arrive in this space and in every space with the energy believing that He's walking alongside me. And He's looking to do something really great in my life. I just have to be ready to receive it. Would you receive it? Let's pray. There's so many things, God, that affect how we see the world. Our age, our ethnicity, our family background, our politics, our faith. There's so many things that affect it. Our fears, our anger, our judgments, our sadness. But what if on the other side of our divorces, or what if on the other side of our losses, or what if on the other side of receiving medical reports that are grim, what if on the other side of those there's actually life and life to the full? I pray in this space that wherever we find ourselves, whatever place of hope or hopelessness that we dwell in that you would renew our eyes, that you would resurrect our eyes, that you would help us to see that you are with us and for us always, and that you are leading us into a new way of living, or that is what you want to do. And I pray this day that you would awaken us to the idea that you are making all things new, even us. And that it would fill us and flood us with such hope that we would begin to see differently. Because once we see differently, then we can live differently. And that's my prayer for me and for us and for all this world. That your kingdom would come and your will be done in this place as it is in the heavens. In Christ we pray. Amen. Please stand.